Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, future, if we can find out about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, the world's only remaining full-time Beatles reporter, (laughs) who writes for everyone who will carry his stuff, which includes Billboard, Variety, Dot com for all of those, uh, Axis.com, uh, Goldmine, new titles added almost every week. Um, <laughs> and also the I author so. of the book, <laughs> Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Hey, Alan. Hey, everyone. And today we are going to be talking about a new album of George Harrison covers by Randy Bachman, who has other Beatles connections as well. Um, Steve interviewed him recently, and we're going to hear some clips from that interview, and we'll also discuss the album, which I, at least two of us, we, I, haven't, I haven't asked Ken, but uh, Steve and I seem to both feel differently the more recent times we've heard it than than originally. I think it's an album that grows on you, so uh, we'll be talking about that. But first, we have our regular news segment, starting with, I believe there's an auction of some famous pictures, right, Steve? Yeah, there's an auction on the 24th um, by Omega Auctions uh, in England that includes a bunch of Beatles stuff, but one of the, the one of the highlights is the is the negatives and the copyright to Mike Mitchell's photos of the Washington Coliseum show, which were auctioned several years ago by Christie's. And actually, he told me when I talked to him last week that he actually sold some pictures at Beetlefest for I believe it was about twenty dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine buying some of those? I mean, these are gorgeous photos because if you've seen them, you know the ones I'm talking about. But anyway, um, he's selling them – or they're selling them uh, at auction on the 24th. And there's a couple of interesting stories that he told me. I mean, he was just a, a young 18-year-old kid when he shot the show, and he, mm-hmm. he begged and pleaded to, to shoot it. And he said uh, – he told me a couple of interesting stories back when we were talking about eight days a week. Uh, I think, Alan, you were the one that was, was talking about the way – about the colorization of the Washington mm-hmm. Coliseum footage. And he said that one of the things that he noticed when he saw the film, which, by the way, does not have his photos in it, even though they – he offered to – you know, they, they had discussed using him. They ended up not using them, was the – the colorization was wrong for the coat he was wearing. Uh, He was wearing a camel hair coat and they colored it as gray, which he said, you know, is kind of funny, but he said the coat played very largely in what happened after the Washington show. He also shot them at, at Baltimore. I think he said, I can't remember if I think that was, I can't remember if that was that year or the next year. But he said that he was standing near he was up near the stage and this big monster of a guy came up behind him. We all know who that would be. That would be Mal Evans. Mm-hmm. And Mal Evans said, Don't even think about stealing another drumstick. It turns <laughs> it seems that Mike had had snatched a drumstick from the Washington stage <laughs> and nobody had caught him. But apparently it was on the the film of huh. the concert. And so Mal told him, don't do it again. And he and obviously he didn't. But he said that it was kind of funny. That it was kind of scary. That, uh, Is he auctioning uh, off the drumstick? He doesn't have the drum. He gave the drumstick to a the sister of a girlfriend who he checked with and who no longer has the drumstick and she has no idea where it went. Hmm. 
<laughs> who did who did Mike work for at the time? Um, I can't remember. I don't have my, all my notes in front of me. I don't remember who it was. But in any event. So is he the one who took the picture of the Beatles, you know, all four of them just standing in a line yes. from the back? Yes. That's uh-huh. those are his those are his photos. Okay. Those are, those those are those great photos. So the Times me. used that to illustrate my review of the first four CDs when they came out in 1987. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes. Good picture. Huge they they printed it really huge too. Yeah, so. it's been it's been u- used in quite a few places. I think Billboard used uh his pictures too. Um mm-hmm. on some of my stuff, but um yeah, it's a I mean he if you've seen the photos there's I think one of Ringo with a spotlight in back of him. There's uh you know uh, George and uh, George and Paul doing harmony. There's a, a, just a bunch of great ones. I mean, they're really, really nice. Is and there any sell- sense of what he's hoping to get for these at the auction? I, you know, we didn't go into that, and I didn't look at the the worth. I mean, they did very well when when Christie's sold them. Okay. Um, so I would expect that you know, with the copyright, there's going to be a there's. He's expecting a lot of money. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly how much, though. Hmm. So, is it the entire set? Yes, it's everything. You know how many photos that amounts to? About? I I could look up the story that I wrote uh, for Access and tell you. Uh, I don't remember. I th- or we can just refer the readers to your story in Access.com. Yeah, <laughs> look at the story in Access. It, it 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 has some of the details written off of the. That, that that I because I wrote about the uh, the auction there before I talked to him, so anyway, okay. okay. So there is also uh, some new video releases coming out too that you wanted to point out to our listeners. Yeah, uh, the Rock Hall of Fame is putting out a bunch of uh, uh, or induction ceremony videos, and the one. With Ringo is one is the one included, and of course that includes Paul McCartney. That's the only Beatle link in that particular set. I don't have the date in front of me, unfortunately. It's from 2014 through 2017 concerts okay. from from those years or performances okay. from those years. Yeah, I'm trying to look up to see what what date. Oh, 20, April 24th is when they're coming out. So yeah, and uh, there's a lot of other people. ELO is in there. Uh, is in a, is in the the group of videos. Deep Purple, Chicago Rush, yes. A bunch of uh, Bruce Springsteen is in in there because the E Street Band gets uh, inducted. So there's a whole bunch of different, uh, all sorts of different people um, in there. So mm-hmm. wonder why they don't have. Well, I guess they. They're too recent for them to include the Beatles or McCartney's inductions. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. this is only the set of 2014 to 2017, mm-hmm. so they're not putting out they're not putting out all of them. It's just those uh, those years. I see. That's all. That's all. Okay. Can you you uh, want to comment? No, uh, just that we have a, a couple of uh, passings to talk about. That's right. Um, one of which is that of Paul White. And um, for those of you that don't know, because we had Pierce Hemmingson on our show, he is the author of the book The Beatles in Canada. It's everything you wanted to know about the, the whole Beatle mania explosion as it happened in Canada in his book. Um, Paul White was a very important guy. He came from England. He was a journalist there. He wanted to start a new life and a new career over in Canada. He ended up working in at the warehouse at Capitol Records. And he eventually, in Canada, became their big A&R guy. And um, he took a chance on Beatles singles when they were sent over there, starting with Love Me Do. And even though the singles didn't do very well, I believe Love Me Do only sold something like 150 copies in Canada. Really? But then Please Please Me came out, then From Me to You. They all did a little bit better, and it wasn't until She Loves You became the big hit over in Canada that, uh, you know, Beatlemania just ignited there. <laughs> and uh, there were salesmen that contacted White, and they said, we have to get an album out in Canada. So White, through his contacts at EMI, uh, he had them send over the master tapes. 25,000 copies were printed in two days of their album called Beatlemania, which really was like with the Beatles. Um, and 50,000 copies 
were sold in two weeks, which is a lot for Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, so he deserves a lot of credit because he had the foresight to believe in the Beatles early on. And um, he also was responsible to, uh, to help give a break to someone who became a very successful female artist in the 70s and 80s. And that was Anne Murray. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So Paul White uh, was 85 years old and he just passed away. Incidentally. We did the interview, as I said, with Pierce Hemmingson. If you want to listen to it, it's show 220. I also did my own private interview with Pierce. And when his book, The Beatles in Canada, came out last year, there were only 1,000 copies made. And 200 of those were hardcover. 800 were softcover. But the ones that were hardcover were all signed by Paul White. Uh -huh. So that's probably going to be uh, you know, a bit of a collector's item for that reason. Mm -hmm. And Pierce told me that his follow-up book, which takes you past um, the end of 1963, uh, it's actually kind of like what he called the, the, the blue book. <laughs> it's the later years of the Beatles, and that's coming out the end of this year, he hopes. And I understand he actually premiered the CD at the fest, is that right? Did you see that? There is a CD that's going to accompany the second book, and he right. did have it at the fest. But I don't know. I don't think he played it. He just had copies there. Oh, he just had copies without just without had... the book, just the CD. Okay, yeah, because he he posted about that on Facebook uh, the other day. There's a lot of rare clips in there of um, interviews that were broadcast in Canada at the time, or DJs from Canada as they were playing Beatle records, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, for historical reasons, it's very interesting to listen to that stuff. Right. Right. Okay. And the other passing this week was Ken Dodd, the comedian from Liverpool. Um, and I think, if nothing else, uh, American listeners and viewers would remember him from uh, that. Actually, it was never really shown here, but the Granada TV special, Beatles 62 to 65, there was a a bit of an interview with him and the Beatles together. Um, and that was only part of it. It's a, it's a much longer clip, actually, which is floating around out there among collectors. Yeah, uh, well, that circulated on Facebook quite a bit after he passed. Every mm -hmm. I, saw it, I saw it a bunch of times. The unedited so, one? I don't know if it's the unedited one. It's on YouTube. There is, a, there is a clip on YouTube. I don't know if it's the unedited version or not. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. But... Yeah, the one I saw was about 15 minutes long. Yeah, that could be the end. And it was, it's kind of interesting because the person, uh, there was a guy who interviewed Ken with the Beatles mm -hmm. collectively, and it was all about explaining their success. So it wasn't like we were just targeting the Beatles alone. Ken had a lot to say about his own success, and, and there was a lot of great banter between him and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So. There was. I mean, there was, there, there was really sort of a, a spark there. You know, he was able to um, sort of make fun of them, really, uh, and uh, and they were fine with it. I mean, they, they seemed to get a kick out of it as well, and uh, it was sort of interesting. And, and did, do you know much more of his work, Ken? I know that he had hit records in the early 60s in England only. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, he was really known for being very quick-weighted and having one-liners as a comedian. Mm -hmm. and, I, also, um, I also heard his, his shows were extremely long. I mean, he used to do very long shows, um, which is kind of unusual for a comedian. But yeah, he, he uh, apparently he put on some really good shows from I, several people had commented who saw him. Yeah, I um, I have in front of me David Bedford's Facebook page because he posted something about Ken Dodd right after he died, and it says, sad news from Liverpool, we've lost one of the funniest men who ever lived. Lucky to have met him and managed to survive a five-hour show of his, too. Mm -hmm. Great man. So, five hours of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. That's even further, that's even longer than I guessed. I, I did, wow, five hours. Woo! It's like got her down okay. run. Um, really? And finally, uh, the other news this week uh, in the Beatle world, I guess, is the uh, fest was this past weekend, and Ken went and, in fact, appeared at it. Um, so what did you see, Ken? What was it like? 
Um, it was pretty action packed. I was only there on Saturday, but I managed to get a lot in. Um, in the ballroom, I got to see uh, Jeff Slate perform with Roy's Boys. Mm-hmm. Roy's Boys meaning Roy Orbison's and Sons. Mm-hmm. He has three surviving sons, and two of the three were there. And it was a uh, tribute to the Traveling Wilburys because this year marks the 30th anniversary of their debut album. So there was some Traveling Wilburys music and also individual members of the Wilburys, like they played um, This Is Love from George Harrison and uh, You Got It from Roy Orbison. It was really a great performance overall. Just fun to see Jeff with uh, you know some really great musicians, and two of them happened to be Roy's sons. Alex Orbison mm-hmm. uh, plays drums, and Roy Orbison plays guitar, and they both sang lead vocals at different times. And um, it's it's kind of interesting, especially when Roy Orbison Jr. was trying to sing Roy's parts, mm-hmm. and that's not easy to to tackle. <laughs> How did he do? You know, it, he did okay, but you know, there's only one Roy, right? And um, he did a, he still did an admirable job right there, and. Um, I got to see, uh, let's see, a couple of panel discussions. I was on one panel with Darren DeVivo talking mm-hmm. about our favorite solo Beatles songs, and Kid O'Toole was supposed to be on the panel with us, but uh, her father was ill and had to be hospitalized, and right. she had to watch yeah. over him. Mm-hmm. And so, actually, we we feel so terrible for Kit because she was supposed to be on, I think, six panels, so she missed all of them. Hmm. For the whole weekend, but I had a fun time with Darren and getting feedback from from the audience, picking our favorite solo Beatles songs from each of the four Beatles. Darren's list of songs was great, and he added his own insight, and that was a lot of fun. And then after my panel, then Jeff Slate did a panel with Roy's Boys, and then that was really very enlightening, having a lot of stories to tell about Roy's relationship with the Beatles. Um, Roy Orbison Jr. in particular is a lot of fun to talk to because it seems like his whole mission is to tell the world, you know, how innovative Roy was in a mm-hmm. number of ways as a singer and as a songwriter and his recordings and what he did first. And sometimes a lot of people may not believe that he was the first to do certain things, but Roy Jr. is so passionate about it. And he's a lot of fun when he talks. Mm-hmm. Can you give I us an idea that, of some uh, of some of the things that he was um, claiming f- for his father having done first? Well, I remember, I don't know if this was at the, the panel discussion, but he was saying that um, a lot of Roy's songs were known for not having solos at all. They were strictly, you know, verse chorus with vocals. And so I remember, because when I interviewed um, Alex Orbison talking about this, I always thought, no reply was kind of Roy Orbison esque Mm -hmm. to me. That's just my ears talking here. But you know, he was when he listened back to the song, he was saying, I can hear how you could think that way. Oh pretty woman, starting off the way it did with the guitar solo like that, and how the song revolves around uh the guitar break like that was kind of new for its time. Mm -hmm. Things like that. I also heard that um when Roy died the other four Wilburys were the pallbearers at Roy's funeral, mm-hmm. which I never knew before. Okay. Can you picture Bob Dylan as a pallbearer? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Uh, things like that. I saw Billy J. Kramer in the ballroom, and he was talking with Ken Dashow from Q104 about um, the British singers of the time, of the, of the, the 50s and early 60s the big influences on the Beatles and the British artists like himself, talking about Skiffle and Lonnie Donegan, but also mentioning a lot of British singers from that period that you don't really know all that much about here. If you remember those those compilations that came out on vinyl many years ago, the history of British rock, mm-hmm. I think they were on Sire, and you'd have names like Marty Wilde, mm. you know, people like that, the Vipers, all these other artists, he would talk very much about them, and then he would on guitar, on acoustic guitar, perform some of those songs. And, um, yeah, Johnny Ray. I mean, that's, that was a name that was, that was big here. But um, that was very interesting. It's always fun to see the band Liverpool perform. They did many songs from the White Album, and they backed up a lot of the artists there. Neil Innes, I really didn't get to see perform, 
Part of the problem in going to the fest, and I say this every single year, every single year, is that there's so many things going on simultaneously that you can't do everything you want to do. And while I was doing my panel discussion, Peter Asher and Jeremy Clyde were performing in the ballroom. Mm. And my own wife had to leave my own panel discussion because she wanted to see Peter and Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also knew that um, this past week I would be seeing Peter and Jeremy in concert anyway, so I didn't mind missing them at the fest. But also, while Roy's boys were doing their panel, Neil Innes was performing in the ballroom, so I (laughs) I couldn't get to see Neil. So, but it was a lot of fun. I spent about an hour on the ninth floor getting to meet many of the Beatle authors that I never get to see. I only get to talk to, usually on Skype. And it was great to meet uh, a lot of people like Jude Kessler and David Bedford and Ken Womack. And, uh, well, Bruce Spizer was there, obviously, mm-hmm. and Pierce Hemmingson. So I have to reserve a certain amount of time when it's not as busy downstairs to meet all the authors. But... It was a lot of fun. It's always a blast to see the the end of the night, the big concert, when everybody comes on stage and Liverpool backs them up. And uh, I had a blast. I think I'm actually going to take the plunge next year and take a hotel room and and be there for all three days. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only way that you can get to do everything you want to do. But I think I accomplished quite a lot in one one day. How well attended was it? It was. It seemed very well attended. I, I, I seem to think because most of the activities were on the third floor, mm-hmm. um, and there was still plenty of space to move around. But yet, when there were big activities in the ballroom, it was near packed. So I would say the ballroom must hold at least close to 1,000 people, I would think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think it was well attended, but I can only judge Saturday, which is always the busiest day of the weekend. Right. Okay. So you were unable to see um, Peter Asher and Jeremy Clyde at Fest, but you made up for that, apparently. Yeah, well, they were playing at Daryl's house. That's Daryl Hall's uh, place. And it's just a great show because uh, Peter Asher, who is such a great storyteller, has been doing concerts for for years now, ever since Peter and Gordon reunited. And um, half the show is him telling stories about his career. And he definitely has the gift for Gap. No, no. And he's got so much history. I mean, just on the Beatles alone. Mm-hmm. You know, the stuff that, that Paul gave to Peter and Gordon, the Jane Asher connection, obviously, working at Apple, working at the Indica Gallery. He told stories all about that. And he does that in all of his concerts, practically. But he changes it based on who he's sharing the stage with. And so... Um, you know, this time he had Jeremy Clyde, and from what I understand, Chad Stewart um, is really kind of retired now. He doesn't want to go out and perform. Right. Like used That's the main reason why he's not with Jeremy. So it's cool that you can combine these two people together since Gordon passed away mm-hmm. several years ago. But um, they they alternated between Peter and Gordon songs and Chad and Jeremy songs. They showed <laughs> photos of their records, their albums. They actually showed... Um, Peter showed, oh no, Jeremy showed the back of a, a Chad and Jeremy album, which by mistake had, well, there were several photos of Chad and Jeremy, but at the bottom there was a Peter and Gordon photo by mistake. And that was <laughs> done deliberately by the record company. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and they talk about how a lot of people back then, believe it or not, did confuse the two. I can see that. Yeah. And there was always the short guy wore the glasses you know <laughs> and then the tall guy was the better looking one of, of the two usually and um no that they, they they sounded really good together mm-hmm. it was really nice whenever the two of them harmonized on each other's songs and you would never hear it in any other circumstance and they're great harmony songs too mm-hmm. there are certain songs that i noticed that they didn't work on together like there'd be a peter and gordon song like um i don't want to see you again Peter sang that with Jeffrey Allen Ross, who's the musical director of the show. He plays the the keyboards. Hmm. And Jeffrey Allen Ross is always with Peter Asher whenever he tours, and also with uh, Joey Molland, Denny Lane. He works with them. They sometimes have a similar backing band. And, um, you know, Jeffrey's a great keyboard player, very good singer, so he blends well with Peter. And there might be um, like a, a Chad and Jeremy song that Peter doesn't sing. 
but usually you know they they did sing together and it's nice to hear those two voices come together because they're great harmony songs and the stories behind them most people don't even know you know so it's it's great for them to share their history to show film clips of them because um jeremy clyde in particular has had quite a career as an actor mm-hmm. in fact he's been in downtown abbey um i don't know the name of the character that he plays but he's been in it um and mainly a lot of films that you'd know if you lived in england mm-hmm. <laughs> right. it was over here but um and the and they show the clips that that i know steve you would love uh you know chad and jeremy on the dick van dyke show and mm-hmm. uh and on patty duke and uh also on batman and right. they Almost every single time you would see uh, when Chad and Jeremy performed together, they always played those clips. And it's a lot of fun, and a lot of the, the people who grew up on it hadn't seen it for a long time. And they make fun of it, they poke fun of it, but it's, it's all, uh, you know, good fun. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's such a rarity that, to see these two people together, and you've got to treasure these moments because you don't know how much longer they're going to keep doing this. That, that Dick Van Dyke episode with them is one of my favorite shows of all time i love that and not uh-huh. only, not only because it 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 you know it's it's supposed it's linking to the beatles the you know the red coats were supposed to be you know very beatleish but it was just uh, just a, a a wonderful show uh there were so many great moments uh richard deacon was was really really good in that show i've seen i've, I've seen that show so many mm. times it's unbelievable yeah but, yeah, that's one of my favorite sitcom episodes of all time. Oh yeah, so, great writing, right. great cast. But that particular it's... that particular episode was a lot of fun. Uh, mm-hmm. And as I recall, they did. I believe they did. They did a they did a, a song linked to the Beatles in there at the end. I'm, my, I'm blanking out. I can't remember which one now. But anyway, it was a great. It's a great. It's a great show. So mm-hmm. I mean, that particular show was a great show. Anyway. Yeah. So, Ken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moving right along, um, you also, since our last show, interviewed the songwriter Jimmy Webb, I gather. Yes. Well, the only reason I'd, I'd bring that up is because, um, well, Jimmy, to me, is one of the great songwriters of all time. And to me, he's in, like, the same league of uh, a Burt Bacharach or a Paul Williams. I'm always fascinated by people who are songwriters who are better known for their writing than their actual recordings of their music. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Webb is best known for the songs that he wrote in the late 60s and early 70s, like the first three hits for Glenn Campbell. Big hits, I should say. By the time I get to Phoenix, Galveston, Wichita Lyman. He wrote Up, Up and Away for The Fifth Dimension. Um, He also wrote All I Know for Art Garfunkel. Uh, Of course, MacArthur Park for Richard Harris. Later, a, a number one hit for Donna Summer. The Worst That Could Happen by uh, The Brooklyn Bridge was written by Jimmy Webb. Mm -hmm. But I bring up Jimmy because he put out his memoirs uh, a year ago. There's a book called The Cake in the Rain, which obviously is a reference to MacArthur Park. And there are quite a number of Beatles stories in there. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed him for an hour. And the interview is on my website. And half of the interview is him just talking about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And in particular, he attended one Beatles session. He got to know three of the four of them, although he would say it's really difficult to know any of them. Mm-hmm. But he has some very interesting stories to tell, and I would definitely advise our listeners to listen to that interview, because there's probably some things you never heard before. And coming from someone who's a premier songwriter like that, I wanted to know how the Beatles influenced him in particular. Look, if I, if I had Burt Bacharach in the same room, I'd like to know his opinion of the Beatles, too, coming from the perspective of one of the greatest songwriters. So we tackle that. He attended uh, the session for Honey Pie at uh, Trident Studios in London. We talk about <laughs> of that. Of all things, if you could go to only one Beatles session, <laughs> yeah, right. and, and it turned out to be Honey Pie, um, yeah. Mm. Which actually proved to be a very unpleasant experience for him. Mm. And, Why is uh, that? I, well, I'll say this briefly. About six months before he went to that session, he got a phone call out of the blue from Paul McCartney. And Paul said to him, I'm putting together an album for this new singer, Mary Hopkin. Would you write a song for her? 
And Jimmy was, first of all, quite shocked that here on the phone, out of the blue, is, is Paul McCartney. And he was a bit starstruck. And um, he said, sure, I'll definitely, I'd love to write a song for Mary. He never got around to writing the song um, because I guess he was too busy at the time. But somehow it was arranged that he would meet the Beatles at Trident Studios. And when he went into the room, he said, the air was so thick you can cut it with a butter knife. <laughs> and um, the thing that was very strange was that Paul kept, he said to uh, George Martin and I guess to the other Beatles, oh, look, Tom Dowd is here. <laughs> Tom Dowd, the great producer or engineer for Atlantic Records. And Jimmy didn't know what to make of this. And every time he tried to correct him, he kept on talking over him. What do you think, Tom, of this? <laughs> Tom, what do you think of this? And he kept getting it wrong. <laughs> and Jimmy didn't know why he was doing this. And he was starting to question maybe because he didn't write the song for Mary Hopkin or whatever. Maybe nobody in the room knew that he was Jimmy Webb, although that's kind of hard for me to believe because you would think if you're attending a Beatles session, they'd know in advance who's going to be in the room with you. Mm -hmm. So... The only Beatles that he got to talk to at the session were Paul, and then towards the end, as he was about to leave, George Harrison walked over to him, shook his hand, and said, by the way, nice arrangement on MacArthur Park. <laughs> so, obviously, George knew who he was. Right. I think the Beatles do. You don't know why Paul behaved the way he did, but he was very uncomfortable about that. <laughs> so, Interesting. You don't know why he acted that way. It was pretty bizarre when you think about it. Why would he do that? Uh, Jimmy thought it could just be Paul taking the piss out of you, you know? Could be. You know, play in with you. So, and then at the same time, later on, mainly through Harry Nilsson, because Jimmy was close to Harry Nilsson, he got to know John and Ringo. Never really spent that much time with Paul at all, and he spent a little bit of time with George. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we talk about that. Um, in the interview, and there was one album that Jimmy made called Land's End, which came out in 1974, and Ringo played drums on it. Mm -hmm. And as I learned, he was only on one song. And um, I wouldn't have even known about that album had it not been for All Together Now by Wally Pedrasic, <laughs> because it's right there in the book, in the Small discography. World. But um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Jimmy talks about having Ringo on a session with him, and he also talks about. And you have to let him tell the story because he's it's kind of becoming sort of well known. The story about how Jimmy gave a deposition on John's behalf when John had the problem with Harry Nilsson at the Troubadour. Hmm. And they had the problem with a woman who was there who was trying to take a photo. And John was accused of either hitting the woman or damaging the camera. And Jimmy went on John's behalf and gave a deposition that John didn't touch the woman or touch the camera. So, you know, he tried to help John out that way, and Harry Nilsson was begging him to help John out. He said, you got to do it for John. And Jimmy would say, why should I do this? And Harry would say, because he's a beetle. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do this for John. You know, and so, you know, that's kind of like an unwritten law. You know, you're of that generation. They represented us. You got to do this for him. Hmm. And, you know, he didn't single-handedly save John, but I'm sure it helped mm -hmm. that he went down and did that. But there are stories like that in my interview with Jimmy. And the other half of my interview is all about Glenn Campbell. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Glenn Campbell fan, I think you'll enjoy that. He's actually doing a concert this particular week on Thursday, which is the 22nd, at Infinity Music Hall in Hartford. And it's called the Glenn Campbell Years, and it's a multimedia show. And there's lots of rare photos and videos of Glenn Campbell, virtual duets. Hmm. And he also performs other songs from his career, too, Jimmy. And that you, they really were very close, Jimmy Webb and, and Glenn Campbell. I liken Glenn Campbell, he was kind of like what Dionne Warwick was to Burt Bacharach. Mm -hmm. And there's <laughs> over 100 songs, 100 songs that Jimmy wrote that Glenn Campbell recorded including on the last album, Adios, from Glenn Campbell, there's four songs that Jimmy Webb wrote. Hmm. So um, if you're in the Hartford area in Connecticut, go see that show. I'm going to be there. And uh, I've seen Jimmy in concert. He puts on a fantastic show. Okay. 
So, who's a big Randy Bachman fan here? <laughs> well, I like him a lot. Yeah, okay. He has a new album out. And so, Steve, you've interviewed Randy Bachman spe- specifically about this album, um, and we're going to be hearing a, a section of that interview. Why don't you um, set that up for us? Well, he and I talked on the phone and, um, for about, I don't know, about a half hour or so, and, and he and he had some good stories that which you'll hear as part of the the clips uh he talks about why he did the album and what was you know what was his motivation you know what was his um plan to the way he covered them and one question i asked him that nobody else seemed to ask him was if he had ever met george harrison and there is a very funny story in there um, about how they met. Actually, they they didn't meet in person, but they they did talk to each other. And there's a, a, a cute story in the in the section uh, that I provided from the interview of how they how they actually got in contact. What's interesting is though that, and I don't want to take away from what you guys have to say about this is this is not a what I would call a standard cover album this is not one of these albums where you know somebody else just picks up and does the same kind of song you know follows the arrangements exactly uh for example um i guess Artem mccartney is a good example of that where they used a lot of the exact arrangements with mccartney uh not all of them but a, a lot of them they did that's not the case here he really went out of his way to be different and that's the that's the interesting thing about the album is that he that some of the songs especially when they start you kind of go what song is he doing now you have to kind of look at the album look at the your cd and and see what the title is in some cases because it's so different Mm -hmm. but okay so let's um let's let it rip and then we'll talk about the record after um he's spoken for himself what made you decide sure. to do this this tribute album? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I was throwing at Burton Cummings about five or six years ago, just as Backman and Cummings, after the trail off of the Guess of Reunion, which started in 2000. Mm-hmm. It just petered out, and so we got demands for Backman and Cummings. Mm-hmm. And so we were touring together, and people said, we want you to do an album. And the, the quickest way to do an album was, we called it Jukebox. He picked five or six songs he liked, that he used to play in the Jukebox as a teenager, and so did I. And we re-recorded them. So we had Gary Lewis and the Playboys and Chuck Berry and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I chose to do Happy Just to Dance with You. And you can't outdo the Beatles. So I rearranged it like Clapton doing um, Layla. And so okay, I'm happy just to dance with you. Very acoustic and a nice shuffle, slightly different chords. And everybody loved it. Everyone has just told me it's, their, it's the most enduring song from the album. The album is about seven or eight years old. And they liked that song the best. Uh, I was in... Um, Invited to Liverpool three years ago for John Lennon's 75th birthday. So I go there, and a friend of mine, Jeff Perry, owned the Beatles stage show, Let It Be. And I go and see Let It Be, which is great. It's the band just doing all the Beatles songs mm-hmm. in different costumes. And um, I do the tour. I go to, I mean, just a tourist. I go to, I'm staying at the Hard Day's Night Hotel. I stay in the John and Yoko bedroom. Um, I take the, the Beatles bus tour to the Caspar and the cellar and go to the Beatles Museum. The next day is John's birthday. His sister comes, uh, Julia, and brings everybody brownies, which is John's favorite birthday cake, gives everyone John glasses, and I'm totally enthralled with the whole thing. <laughs> and I come home, and I'm looking for something to do. And my, I got a lot of friends in radio, and they say, we love your blues album, Heavy Blues, which I thought about two years ago. But we only can play in our car. We can't play it on the radio. I go, why not? I've got incredible guests in there. Neil Young, Joe Bonamassa, Scott Holliday, mm-hmm. Robert Randolph. He's saying, we can't play it. We have bosses that give us a playlist. And so I figured, well, I'm not going to get any airplay anyways. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. So I, I write a bunch of blues songs. It gets time for, uh, I'm looking ahead going, to what can I do that's different that will please me, that will interest my fans? Hey, George is going to be 75 next year. I think I'll take a bunch of his songs. Because I always did the George songs in every band I was in. Being the lead guitar player, our lead singer would always do the Paul or John song, and I always got to sing the George songs. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to get some George songs, treat them as a songwriter, because I hear a lot of um, my songs got covered, like Junior Walker did These Eyes, 
Kurt Elling sang a great version of She's Come Undone. Letty Kravitz said American Woman. A couple other bands have done Taking Care of Business, Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. And after a while, you go, what did this guy do to my song? And after a while, you go, hey, that's not bad. Gee, it's number two on the charts. Well, he reinterpreted my song. And then you meet the guy, and he goes, yeah, I love your song. I hope you like what I did to it. And you say, of course you like I love what you did to it. But it's just a different impression. And so I thought, I'm going to try that with the George songs. You can't outdo the Beatles. I can't outdo George. It would be a pale comparison and a whole hum album. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to go to the edge and do some real shocking stuff. And there's a, um, there's a site you can go to on the Internet where some guy somewhere has taken all the Beatles songs, all the Beach Boy songs, four seasons, and if it's a major, I don't know how he does it, he makes it a minor key. And the mm. song sound very intriguing, but, and you know the song, but it has a slight little bend in the middle, a slight little twist. So I thought, well, I'm really going to do this. So I take Here Comes the Sun, which is a beautiful, sunny song in, a, in D major, and I make it D minor, and I make it kind of a reggae, and it works. And I go, wow, incredible, I'm just going to keep trying this. I'm going to ignore the original, which is very, very, very hard to do. So I know when a lot of people hear my album, and I've watched a lot of reactions from like 10-year-old kids to people in their 70s, listening to the groove I've set up going, hmm, hmm, good groove. And suddenly when we start singing, they know what it is. They sing along to it. So it shows it's a great song. The melody line is very close to the original, and the lyrics are the same. I just put that a different set of clues, uh, clothes on that mannequin, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so working with like 30 George songs, I end up with 15. I send them to my band, like this is in Toronto. Send it to my band in Vancouver, and they go, wow, we're going to try some vocals on this. They send it back to me, and I go, wow, great, let's go into the studio. So we booked a studio. We went in with these demos that I created in different temples on GarageBand, different drums, and then my drum, we played, we, this was like, uh, my computer was our George Martin, in, so to speak, because it set the tempo, it set the groove. Me and my band set up with headphones and played live to the computer, like it was a conductor mm -hmm. with the groove. So we replicated the groove that I had in GarageBand, the drum groove, and we played the instruments, and we re-sang everything over that. And we ended up having a really great, joyful time uh, in the studio. Like, what band wouldn't love recording Beatles songs, but there's no point in doing them unless you kind of do them different, right? So we, we just had great fun doing it. A lot of it was mistakes. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, uh, trying to do, I mean, some of George's songs are very staid. In other words, they're, they're not exciting. They're nice. Mm-hmm. So you like me too much, and I like you. If you listen to the original, it's, so you've gone away this morning, you'll be back again tonight. Repeat. Right. Well, you mean, and then it repeats and repeats and repeats. That's kind of nice, but I found this loop. That was this weird acid jazz thing with finger snaps. I go, so I'm going to try singing this song over that loop. I would just get a loop from Apple Loops or from Garage and try to sing. I had all George lyrics printed out, all his song titles. Can I sing this song to this tempo and this loop? No, it needs, I'll speed it up because the words don't fit in between the beats. No, I'll slow it down. Now let me try a couple of chords. When I found this drum uh, loop for um, uh, You Like Me Too Much and I Like You, it had a keyboard in it that I couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how to do, I'm not a rocket science with these loops. I just took the loop in the woods. So there's a keyboard in there playing these three incredible jazz chords. I go, wow, that's kind of like what I did on Blue Collar with BTO or She's Come Undone. So... I'll just leave those chords in it. I'll try to find notes that fit into that chord. And I'll take a little bit of liberties here, like Kurt Elling did with Undone, or like, like John Pizzarelli does with a Joni Mitchell song or something, right? Mm -hmm. or, or a Beatles song. And so I, I sang, you know, so you've gone away this morning, but you like me, that kind of thing. And um, if I needed someone, you know, uh, da -da -da -da, if, if, you, if you listen to If You Needed Someone, you see how I went on that song, and sang away from the George thing. And then the next song, You Like Me Too Much and I Like You, I had seen the Gypsy Kings three night in a row, and I came home and I wrote a Gypsy Kings song. And when I finished recording it, I just automatically started to sing, So You've Gone Away This Morning, You've Come Back and Play, and the chords fit together in the same key. And so I made that song that I had written to be a Gypsy Kings tribute. I made it part of the George Harrison song. And so a lot of things were just accidental that happened that I went, <laughs> wow, this is as incredible as walking on stage with a broken string, putting on a string and writing the riff to American Woman, or writing Taking Care of Business on stage. This is the same kind of gift from this god of songs giving me this opportunity to open up and take this stuff and, and, and hug it and, and you know, hold it close to me and do it.
did you ever have any encounters with George? Did you meet him or? I never met him. I spoke to him once on the phone. Uh, when I left the Guess Who in 1970, our press agent's name was Richie York. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Guy. Oh, yes. Uh, he very and then Rich, R- Richie was working with Derek Taylor in London. Mm-hmm. And Richie called me and he said, I know you've got to go into the hospital. And you're, out, you're out of the Guess Who and they've got a couple of guys to replace you. But George Harrison's putting together a band and I just met with him and Derek Taylor. And I'm going to give you his number. So give him a call. He's putting together a band. I go, what? Are you kidding? And so, like, this was at noon in Winnipeg, so it was probably six or seven at night in England. Mm -hmm. So I phoned this number, and a beautiful voice answers the phone, who I imagine is Patty Boyd, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I say, hello, I'm so-and-so from Winnipeg, Manitoba, from a band called The Guess Who. And the first thing she says is, Winnipeg, is that the home of Winnie the Pooh? (laughs) And I go, well, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, he was a bear in the zoo here. And when A.A. Milne got a bear, he named him after Winnie Pig. It was Winnie the Pooh. And she goes, oh, and you want to speak to George? Just a minute, George is in the garden. So uh, the garden is their yard, right? Right. And they're having dinner. So I wait and wait two or three minutes, and George comes to the phone, and there's this wonderful, ooh, this Liverpool like drawl kind of thing. And I say, Randy back from the Guess Who? And he goes, oh, I just saw you on top of the Pops doing American Woman, <laughs> and you're not in the band anymore. And I go, yeah, and I'm calling you from Winnipeg. And he says the same thing. Is this where Winnie the Pooh is from? And I say, yeah. And he says, I've already got a band, I've already got a guitar player, and I also hear that you're um, kind of a straight arrow, and we're kind of on a different path. So good luck to you, and quick, and that was it. Who influenced you as a guitarist? Uh, Basically, the first, I I played classical violin growing up from the age of 5 to 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. And it was Royal Conservatory, so it's very straight, and you're playing in a certain position, you have to audition or uh, get um, examined every year, really? real conservatory rules, and you you get a pass. You pass grade one, grade two, grade three, and it's very, very, very boring and very restrictive. And one night, I saw Elvis Presley on TV, on Ed Sullivan, and went, what is that? That's called rock and roll, that's called Elvis Presley, and that's called the guitar. I want to do that. It was so wild compared to me standing there in this position <laughs> playing this little violin because you get a little half-sized violin when you're five mm-hmm. thought I wanted to do that so my first inspiration was Scotty Moore who's playing a kind of a hybrid Eric Cla- um, a hybrid um, Chet Atkins Merle Travis behind Elvis mm-hmm. you know finger picking and then right after that it was like Chuck Berry uh, school days and Johnny B. Good playing all those kind of horn riffs on a guitar and, and then it became Hank Marvin in the shadows from England and then it became the Beatles. Just the Beatles got a different guitar sound on every song, P- cranked it through weird amps and guitars, and every solo was a statement of joy and angst at the same time. Like, what is that guitar sound? And you find out later how they got it. They put it through every board and cranked all the bottom off and cranked the top, and then put it through another board and cranked the top and distorted it and took all the bottom off and did it over and over to sound like no other guitar in the world. And truly, it did. And so they, they were like, I was experimenting. I was trying to do every song different, every solo different. And so I was just inspired a lot by that. Okay. And then the late, the late 60s Brit thing was a real big deal for me. The Clapton, Zeppelin, Hendrix thing, you know, the power trio, the Who, that was like really a big inspiring thing. The guitar became a total solo rhythm and solo at the same time instrument. Uh, and that really changed music with the Brit guys pretty much paying tribute to the Chicago and Delta Bluesmen of the USA, who everyone in the States was neglecting. I, I wrote the song Between Two Mountains because I felt, this is, you know, what would it be like to be George? You show up for a session, there's these two mountains show up, one's called Lennon, one's called McCartney. They bring two dozen songs each, they collaborate on each other's songs, they kind of push you into the corner of the room, and they do all their songs. And then if one of their songs doesn't work out, they say, George, you got anything? And you say, yeah, I've got a little song called Don't Bother Me, or one called something or one called taxman and you get it on there and in between these two mountains he grew to be his own gigantic mountain because he he stood tall he had love he waited for his turn and that's basically what i said in the lyrics in that song was just like pretty amazing so i want to do a solo in the middle of that what george harrison solo can i put in here it's not really a song where we're vamping in a in a key where you can play a solo like you can in taxman or something Mm -hmm. and so in the middle out of the blue in, when my demo was going, I start to play, and I love her. 
and I play the middle of in between two mountains, and it fits and it's perfect, except it's twice as fast because there's a big pause in And I Love Her. But I get to play his whole And I Love Her thing, which is what he wrote. I even put in a little little claves on the one and three beats, like they did it in in And I Love Her. A little, and then, a, a and, little, a little. What was that? A little. What was the what term you just used? Uh, clav clav two little wooden sticks called claves or claves. Oh, okay. If you listen to it, I love it. Goes down, da da da. Okay. These two little wooden, teak little logs that you bang together. Right. So I put that in there, and the, and just to be like him, and then we took the lick for my sweet lord, the high, doo, 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 and that fits in. Um, I don't know what song that's in. Don't bother me, or one of his other songs. Well, you'll know it when you hear the song. Mm-hmm. And even in. Uh, Give me love, give me peace on earth. That had so many chords on it. I, I just I, I couldn't do any better than what he did, so I just made it a three chord who power song. But when we start to sing Gimme Love the third time, because very repetitive Matt Mantra kind of thing, uh, I put in him and Clapton's run from Wonderwall. I might be the only guy who bought the George Harrison Wonderwall soundtrack album. But the main song in that goes doo do 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 that's the lick that him and Harrison are playing and that's in Gimme Love. So, and there's the solo from Taxman is hidden somewhere. The solo from, um, oh, there's a couple other hidden things in there that if you're a real George Harrison or Beatle fan, you listen to it enough, you'll go, oh, wow, that's from so and so song. And isn't it great that it, they fit it in there? Mm-hmm. I was just waiting for passing. Well, I know all of his solos, I played them all, right? So I wait for passing chords or a little space in between a song or put, or say, what can I put over this that's. Very George, make everybody smile, but it's in a different song. Mm-hmm. And I never did My Sweet Lord. I never could. I didn't get the inspiration to change that or do anything different. So we took the licks from that and put it in uh, Don't Bother Me, or I'm not sure what we put it song we put in. So that was uh, interesting to hear. Some, some nice stories. And uh, yeah, I... Um I'm not. I'm not sure. I totally agree with him about what he. Like, he he sort of talks. I think a little bit about how between two mountains isn't so much about George, but it, it seems pretty clearly about George, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yes, it yeah. it absolutely is. It absolutely it absolutely is. He he says the the first uh, stanza of the of the song says, "There's an inner light. Just let it shine. Angels in flight. The space and time." I learned to wait. My time would come. I'd celebrate because I was the one. Now, I, uh, that's interesting the way he, uh, the way that song opens. It says, "I was the one." Um, it, it, that's kind of a weird. I don't. I don't that's a weird way to put it. Mm-hmm. I don't even know that George would say, "I was the one," but <laughs> in any event, that's the way. He, that's what he opens and closes the album with. So. Do you see that? You see what I'm saying there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought it, it, has, it has. Yeah. Go ahead, Kent. It, it does have very Harrison esque guitar playing on it. Oh yeah. So right. It makes you automatically think of him. Mm-hmm. And I automatically, I think I like the analogy of being between two mountains, two giants between Absolutely. John and Paul. Yeah. Well, I, so, no, I I agree with that too. I mean, I I think that is a a great analogy. So. Hmm. Yeah, but the "I was the one" part is is the part I'm talking about. I'm not sure that even he would have said he would thought of himself that way. Maybe he did. I don't know. I mean, I you know, but uh, uh, you know, as a as a, I think they all kind of knew that they shared, you know, the talent in the group. So I I don't know that one person necessarily one person thought themselves better than the others. Do you? Uh, do you? I mean, yeah, I think they all did except Ringo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. One of the interesting things about the album, and he he alludes to this uh, in the interview as well, is that he's not just really paying tribute to George as a songwriter. In fact, actually, he 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 had his arrangements are so vastly different from George's um, that in a way there there are some songs that are like you said earlier Steve not, not immediately recognizable in terms of the tune and stuff like that but what he also does is he's paying tribute to George as a guitarist because mm-hmm. he uses things that George played on Lennon and McCartney songs 
within these George Harrison songs. Like there's a, a, a bit of an allusion to And I Love Her. Um, and at one point in uh, Don't Bother Me, there's a, a bit of the guitar line from It's Only Love, you know, some, some very right. surprising juxtapositions um, that I think is really one of the interesting things about the, the album as a whole. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he mentioned that in the he he mentioned that in the interview with me the way he 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 said he basically stuck him in like Easter eggs for people to yeah. to find. Right. So. Yeah. Um, the arrangements, um, you know, I, I listened to it um, a few weeks ago when um, copies were first sent out, and uh, and I thought, you know. Um, Okay, I mean, I, I understand why these arrangements are so different, because there's really not an awful lot of point to just making a record that's rote imitation. Um, and, you know, any artist doing a cover is going to want to put his own, you know, thumbprint on it. And he definitely did that. Um, but there were, you know, some of them I, I felt like, okay, this isn't really my cup of tea. I, I can see what he's doing. I, I can appreciate what he's doing. Um, but I've listened to it, you know, a couple of times since, and uh, it, it actually does grow on you a bit, I find. And uh, um, some of the things I didn't like originally really, really sound okay to me now. Um, and some of them I still don't like. So maybe two or three more playings, they'll, they'll grow on me too. Um, mm-hmm. I, I thought there were, you know, I mean, I, I for instance if I needed someone is done in a very sort of jazzy way and um, Mm -hmm. wasn't absolutely crazy about it, but it's, you know, it's actually pretty well done. It's well played. You know, the, the melody is a bit altered, but the rhythm is there. The rhythm in a way is going to be dictated by the lyrics to a degree anyway. So, Oh yeah. It was another one. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, and you like me too much. He's got a little bit of the, in my life guitar line. These things are all over this disc, you know. It's you, you find more of them as you keep listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Ken, what was your overall impression? I like it. I still need to listen to it more often, but I tend to go when it comes to cover versions of songs, I like when it's a very different approach. Mm-hmm. Because especially if you're dealing with the Beatles, the closer you get to their own arrangement, the more you're going to compare it to the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And it's never going to be as good as the Beatles. Right. So you might as well make your own. And when I think about my all-time favorite cover versions of Beatles songs, they tend to be from artists who have their own arrangements altogether. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of make it their own. You know, like, uh, you know, a lot of people think Joe Cocker's version of With a Little Health of My Friends is one of the greatest of all the cover of cover versions of Beatles songs and you got to admit it's nothing like the Beatles version same thing with Earth, Wind and Fire got to get you into my life which is one of my favorites but I really like when you take a different approach altogether and in particular you mentioned If I Needed Someone I love that version Mm -hmm. it just leaps off the stereo for me it really works with the jazz arrangement which Mm -hmm. is something that I probably wouldn't have thought of before until I heard this Um, and I I could easily hear that recording of If I Needed Someone being played on on um, contemporary jazz stations. The thing that I also like about this album is that every time you start any of the songs, just based on the introductions, you're never going to know what song it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not apparent. Right. And um, I, I like the fact that he did You Like Me Too Much, which is not a song that is covered all that often. I mean, I'm sure there have been cover versions, but it's got to be one of the least covered Beatles songs. And this has more of a bossa nova kind of arrangement to it. And I think it works. I never would have imagined it this way. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he heard this in his head and attempted to do it this way, I found it really interesting. But by far and away, the, the song that impressed me the most was Here Comes the Sun. Because at the very end of that song, he does this instrumental thing with a real Spanish flavor to it. And it really adds a lot to the song. But the beginning Where part of a... the song is, is, is reggae, which isn't what you would right. imagine immediately for <laughs> Here Comes the Sun. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that works. Yep. It works really well. Where I have a problem with it is where it's so far removed. I mean, you take a song like Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, and it's more like a chant. There's nothing in there that resembles the melody of Give Me Love. True. You know, and I just would never have envisioned it this way. But there are some people who like a radically different 
recording. You know, the, if if the melody doesn't even resemble what George wrote in any way, it's just basically the same words with a different melody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he might as well have written that, different that, words and been, been able to get ro- the royalties all for himself. <laughs> right, and that that's one of the problems that I have with it because the I think see I think the best cover versions are, and you mentioned Joe Cocker's with a little help from my friends, mm. that take the song and add uh, their trademark to it, so that they so that you know what they've done to it, and they haven't just sliced it up to make it different. The Joe Cocker with a little help from my friends is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. Because you know Joe's voice and and the the band the way you know the Grease band the way they the way they took that song, whereas so many of the songs on this album are just it's like he almost wanted to do something so differently that he you know he just he almost it's almost free form what he mm-hmm. did, and in fact one one I didn't read the review but I saw the headline the headline said. Uh, something about he wanted to be different and maybe he went he did too much and I don't know that I would say it that way but uh, it's just that I I had some real misgivings about this album when I first heard it a few weeks ago also and when I I pulled it out today you know in preparation for this and I found myself appreciating it a little more and I'm not saying that listening to it more and more is going to help but I think it's number one. I think it's one of these albums that you have to, you know, listen to. But and and it's interesting, Ken, that you mentioned "Give Me Love" because that's exactly one of the tracks that I still don't think works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I there are. I mean, I like a lot a, a lot of them more than I thought I would. You like me too much, partially because I like the song, and I like what he what he did with the with the samba beat and the, what it turned into. I had a problem with while well, my guitar gently weeps because that's, that's one of George's most direct songs, and he kind of rambles with it. You know, mm. it, it 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 kind of goes all over the place. I like "Handle with Care" because it's like Bach Maternal Overdrive meets the Wilburys. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was wonderful. Um, See, "Handle with Care." A lot. There's. I have a, a problem with covering the Traveling Wilburys, because one of the amazing things, one of one of the best things about the Wilburys music, is the combination of those vocals, especially when you share lead vocals. To do handle with care, and I even felt this way when when it was performed at the concert for George. You're used to hearing starts with George. You know, you got Roy Orbison's part there. You got Bob Dylan singing with. Uh, Jeff Lynne and Tom Petty, that part, you know. But when it's one person singing all the parts, it's lacking something. No, mm. I, I disagree there because it's really? such a great it's because it's such a great song. It's that's one of you know, that that is it, it's one of George's best songs. And I think oh, the lyrics on song. that the mm. lyrics on that song are so wonderful, especially and you can hear you know, you can hear how great the lyrics are when Bachman sings them. So I that I, I I disagree there. I think I uh, I mean I don't have a problem with covering the songs necessarily, but you know it depends on how they're done. Uh, and in this particular case, I think Bachman Bachman actually does a good job with that. Taxman is another one I don't particularly I, I kind of eh, okay. Um, something is another like give give me love, give me peace on earth that he. Totally different apart. melody. Yeah, tears he tears apart, and I and it, I can't get can't get into that. I also liked here the here comes the sun. I was actually listening to. It. I had forgotten about the Spanish guitar at the end when I was listening to it before the show, and then when that started in again, I went, "Oh wow, that's 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 cool," mm-hmm. <laughs> because the guitar work is just so great. And he and I've been told by by friends of mine that he's really, really an accomplished guitarist, and you can hear it there. And Don't Bother Me is another one that, that is really good. Mm-hmm. So you really have to to borrow another solo Beatles song, give this album a chance yeah. um, to, to like it. And it's not, gonna, not necessarily going to mean that you are going to like it. It's not your regular cover version album. It really isn't. So, I, you know, 
There's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is that um, as different as as some of the arrangements are, um, there are a number of instances, for instance, in I Need You and Think for Yourself um, and and several of the others, and particularly Beatle-era Harrison songs, where as much as he's changed of the general arrangements, the vocal arrangement is right there just as it was mm-hmm. and i think it comes through really beautifully and it's a good juxtaposition of of the original and novel touches you know um, it's right. definitely an album that's worth hearing you know it's it's um, and that's why we're devoting so much of this show to it um mm-hmm. and yeah if you can st- if you can stream it definitely stream it and, and give it a you know give it a shot but um, the more i hear it the more i like it but yeah. there's still going to be a few songs that I'm struggling with. Yeah. So that's basically, but, I guess we, we're unanimous on that point. Yeah. It's different. Alan, Alan, could I just ask you my point about Handle With Care? Do you feel like because those different types of vocals that the Traveling Wilburys had made those songs, apart from being really good compositions, really special? And at least for me, whenever I hear somebody do all the lead vocals on a Traveling Wilburys song, where there are multi vocals for lead vocals, I have a problem with it sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have that problem. Um, I think uh, you know, if someone's going to cover it, it, it's just automatically going to be, you know, on their own terms. And unless they've got a group and they're going to pass the vocals around in the group, and even then, it's it, in in this case, it's different because these are four really distinctive singers. Um, Very distinctive, you know who who we have all kinds of associations with, and uh, right. so you know, I, I mean, I think for uh, you know something like "Handle with Care" or any of these the Wilbury things, as you say, my my go to versions are obviously going to be the originals, but um, but I, I, I would I would hate to sort of limit whether they could be covered based on that. Mm. Okay, mm-hmm. good point. So, okay, um, that was uh, our Randy Bachman tribute to George Harrison tribute. Uh, and <laughs> it's a tribute of a tribute of a tribute. And, right. Um, so, so we're going to do another tribute in our next show. Yes, to George. It's, uh, yeah, it's another one to George we're going to do. Well, you know, he deserves it. So... But we're running out of time on this one, so I just wanted to say, um, first of all, if you can get in contact with all of us uh, jointly on the show by writing to things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at things we said fab. We have a Facebook page, things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And. Um, we have a YouTube page. Oh, we have a YouTube page, and we're on um, Podbean and all kinds of places. But, of course, if you're hearing us, you know how to hear us, sort of by definition, right? Right. But a lot of these Podbean, for instance, is very easy to download the shows if you want to um, download them, take them with you, and uh, you know, while you're jogging in the morning or yep. whatever. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I have I have listened to the show while I have been at the gym, and it's it, it's very good, mm. very good to do. So, yeah. Um, so, Steve, how do people get in touch with you? You can get in touch with me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com. Um, let me just put in a, another plug for the YouTube page. Um, for a long time, we've only had about half the shows um, because we started actually after. Alan and and Al joined the show, but now uh, I have been adding all the early shows to that page, and I actually there's also a a playlist with all the interviews we've done, um, all the way back to the beginning, from anywhere from from Free to Kelly, to let's see who else is there, Chaz um, Newby, Chaz Newby, <laughs> uh, Bruce Spicer. Piers Heming- Hemmingson, um, all those, all those, uh, uh, David Bedford, Mark Lewison, Mark Lewison, me, Mark Lapidus, Mark Lapidus. <laughs> Do you know how many times Mark Lapidus has been on our show? Um, Denny was, Sywell. Denny but. Sywell, yes, and that was another, that was another great interview. Anyway, Patty, but Harrison. anyway, 
Patty Boyd. Yes, Patty Boyd was on is on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all those interviews are on the YouTube page, and, uh, in the YouTube playlist, and then the the regular shows, the the non interview shows are being added to the YouTube page. They're all on the Podbean set. But they're being added to the YouTube page um, relatively quickly, so if uh, if you're you don't have to download on the YouTube page, so and it's very easy to find things we said today. Beatles Radio on YouTube is how you find it. But any, anyway, uh, ba- back to me. I have a, a Beatles group on the on the Facebook called Beatles News and Information. Did I did we mention the Facebook page? Yes. The, the shows. Yes. Okay. Then enough from me. I'll I'll shut up. Go. Okay, Ken, what are you giving away this week? <laughs> <laughs> See, we're precluded from entering that. because it's sort of like how you're, you know, your your friends and family can't enter a contest, but so, you know, Ken's always giving away this really great stuff that we can't but Chances get. are you're going to get it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, hey. <laughs> I'm just trying to make um, it sound appealing, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> I do happen to have a special contest that I just started today, and this is a way of celebrating the new inductees to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Mm -hmm. the Moody Blues. And, of course, we're very happy for Denny Lane. And last year, the Moody Blues went on tour in support of the 50th anniversary of the Days of Future Past album, and they performed the entire album. And I went to see them in concert. It was fantastic. And they played a lot of their other classic stuff, too. And they're just releasing right now as we speak a DVD, Blu-ray, double CD, double vinyl LP, and digitally, a Days of Future Past live release. I have three DVDs to give away on my website in a special contest. It's really easy to win. Just go to the home page. There's a link there to my special contest page. And if you love the Moody Blues, and uh, I'm sure many of you do, we have a lot of classic rock British uh, invasion fans and all, just go to the website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And like I said before, new interview with Jimmy Webb, which is on the same page as the Neil Innes interview that I just did recently. Uh, again, KenMichaelsRadio.com. My email address is everylittlething at att.net. Okay, and you can reach me uh, on Facebook, either at just Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. And... Uh, Write to us, send us ideas, send us questions. We answer as many of them as we can. And did we give our email address? I did. Yes, you, you did. did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alan did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> give it again. <laughs> and that email address once again is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Thank you. So we can't, for- can't give it in. We're cracking up here. It's too late. It's, it's been an hour. What can I say? Yeah. So for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.